whereas the Appalachian County School Board has been deemed a closed meeting on this date pursuant to an affirmative record vote in accordance with the provisions of the Virginia Freedom of Information Act, whereas section 2.1-3771D of the Code of Virginia requires a certification by the school board that such closed meeting was conducted in conformity with Virginia law. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Accomack County School Board hereby certifies that, to the best of each member's knowledge, one of the public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements by Virginia law were discussed, and two, only such public business matters as were identified in the motion by which the closed meeting was convened were heard, discussed, or considered.
Um, she, when she started here at Aquamac, she started out in kindergarten, and we noticed that she was having issues with staying busy during her class time. But a special thank you to Mr. Thompson, who was the principal at that time, as well as to Dr. Hall and her team, who took different alternative measures to keep her engaged in the classroom. And in doing so, she was in the kindergarten class, but taking second grade reading at the time. And we, just through multiple testing, um, she was able to test out of the first grade and move forward with her learning. And the, at the time, she skipped up to the second grade for when she returned. But I am grateful for the support that we have received here. And Ms. Willer has been here during that time as well. And so we are happy with the transition that that continuity of education will continue. Um, we're grateful for the support that we've received from the central office and her learnings. And I just want to say thank you to all that you do here at Appomattox Elementary School in support of the students here. Um, I spend a lot of time, as you can tell, within <laughs> the school. I'm not sure how I got drafted to go first, but <laughs> um, here in the school, and each time I will say, it's been a welcoming environment. My daughter's a car rider, so we get greeted in the morning and in the afternoon when she leaves. It's always been a pleasure. Um, we've always had parents um, as well as some of the other faculty members, the teachers here, to be engaged and make sure Ava was always on the right track and just doing what she needed to do and be successful here um, within Acumac County Public Schools. So thank you. Teachers, when teachers were here before students, 
it was really felt. We were celebrated, we were encouraged, we were, there was such attention to detail, and it really made us feel as if we were being like seen, heard, and appreciated, and that goes a long way as a teacher. Um, I will say that with all these changes, give us grace and patience, but we are all here with the same goal, and that's to give the best possible learning opportunity to our little ones who we'll become big ones eventually and go to our middle schools and high schools. By the way, go Firebirds! Firebird for life. <laughs> Sorry for that one, had to throw it in. Um, either way, we're just really excited. Dr. Haynes and Ms. Wheeler have just done so much to just, with the changes, help us embrace them and just feel ready for all this. So we feel very excited for a new school year and we appreciate you all being here today. Go Otters too! Right, right. 
correlations scored 97 in math and 98 in English. Our ELs scored 95 in math and 98 in English. And our students with disabilities scored 60 in math, which did not make the passing um, cut, and 76 in English. However, for our SWDs um, in math, we were able to um, remain accredited um, using our R pen.
much. I think so too. <laughs> schools for a period of time to see how they work and then get them for the other schools? Do we want to put them in the middle schools? I, I guess my thought originally was to see in the high schools, uh, see how they go. I think, from what I understand, they're about eight to $10,000. Um, so I think if we started with the high schools, see how they work and
security guard set up from hope to to receive. With regard to the other suggestions, I would be interested in seeing what the dollar amount would be um, with regard to um, the alternative ed site as an example. Do we have any idea how much of the 950K that would cost? Have these been costed? No, I, wanna, I think before we pass this to staff to sort of price these out, I wanted to see what you all I guess if you haven't priced what school security officers would cost in a contract, 
having our own employees and said, I mean, the DCJS course, they need to be certified as school security. I don't know. I said, sure, possibly. Yeah. They're in trouble now. I don't know what it's going to cost y'all because you know they, they want to be a sheriff's office employee, but um, by law, I believe security officers have to be go through the same training that our school resource officers have. It's a knockdown version because they won't have arrest authority. Mm -hmm. You know, they can do the metal detector, they can do rounds, they can check book bags, you know, but and then again, that's why they go to a school mm -hmm. to know where their limits are on search and seizure, everything else. Um, me personally, <clears throat> hiring Ally to do that, um, they're not going to be certified in the school security officer. So, I mean, just, you know, me personally, I think you'd be better off if they worked under Dr. Hall and her staff, the school security officer. Um, so that would be the instead, of, of, instead of a private firm. Yeah. So that would be the essence so, of that yes. work for Dr. Correct. Dr. Hall. They would work for Accomack County Public Schools. So, so I think they're better off. Yeah. If I'm understanding, and I'm not questioning you, I'm only okay. arrested or anything. Superintendent <laughs> is not in the business of providing security, whereas Ally is but in the business. They don't. Of, they don't have the training that's required. I didn't say to finish my thought. Right? Yeah. yeah. So, so I'm just trying to. So what would they you would have to go to school security officer training oh. before they work in Mackinac Public Schools. And then there's supervision would be through the central office, in, yes. in, in theory. Correct. That, so that's, the, that's why I was trying to just see if my, if my thoughts were actually accurate, that they would get the training. I mean, yeah, they would have to get the training before And then they would be under the supervision yeah. of the school system. Because at the end of the day, the most important thing is our kids' safety. Right. So I hope they get to the proper background checks. And well, what we understand from the company when they came to present, they do go through training. Okay. They have different kinds of training. They have enough field training, which is like Purdue, and they can go to Purdue and Tyson. Then they have school training. That was the reason why they told us at that time that they would not be able to start at the beginning of the year because they had to go through all the training. That's the training I'm talking about. Not, yes, they wouldn't be able to Through start. the state of Virginia. Right, they have to go through, right, they have to go through the training Correct. in order to be able to certify them for them to be um, security. Yes, ma'am. Yes. So they do go through training. I have a question. What's the difference between the school security officer and the school resource officer with the exception of them not working for the sheriff's department? Um, a school in terms resource of officer can enforce the law. Oh, okay. So the school security officers, they can't carry any kind of restraint weapon, scare weapon. That would be up to the Akamai County Public Schools. So um, can we go back to I don't think they can restrain kids. Okay. Can and I would have to go research that program. So where you said that they would work for ACPS, and I think the question was asked, how would central office know how to supervise these people? Would it be a collaborative work between School security and your resource officers, or I think, I think the school board come up with strong policies to to effectively govern, you know, how those people work in the school system. They would work for Akron County Public Schools. I mean, by all means, I will do anything in my power to help y'all and whatever y'all need. But would your would your staff still be in the school system? Yes. You know? Yes, I have four officers. Right now we have three. Um, I have two people in police cabin right now, and come January we'll have four school resource officers for Akamai County Public Schools. Perfect. So if you just could have an idea, a rough idea of how much you think it might cost. I have no clue. Yeah. I, can they tell can you, pay I can tell you if we put 11 
school resource officers in school, it would cost you probably seven hundred thousand dollars. Okay. And is it for me to come up with? It would be well. I have four, so to come up with seven people would probably take me a couple of years to get them all trained, yeah. certified. Because <coughs> people are not knocking down the door to be police officers now. Yeah. And I currently have two officers down right now. I know that um, Chesapeake just did the same thing. They did um, build a six for the cover their elementary schools, and it cost them more. Are there, are there no deputies who are getting ready to retire? <laughs> 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 I just currently, currently, I have, I believe it's nine retired deputies working for me right now. And uh, one of them works for Akamai, Akamando High School. And then the others work in our court system. What about jailers, right? I mean, maybe they're tired of jailers. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, it, you know, I'm just trying ever, to talk about everything for you. <laughs> if it ever got to that point, um, I would open it up to the jail. And with school resource officers, they have to have three years law enforcement experience before they can go into the school now. It's getting really scary. It's tough. And getting somebody qualified to be a school resource officer, I mean, time somebody's in law enforcement three years, they, they want to do law enforcement, you know, they don't want it. So, you know, they find somebody that wants to do school resource officer that's got three years experience, it's tough. And I, you know, thank God I have three right now, and January I'll have four. I'm gonna take somebody from the road and put as the floater um, through the school system, and the two new deputies that are in Peace Academy are going to the road. So, Sheriff, what would you recommend we do? Uh, I think he said. I, I would. Up. I would go out, advertise for school security officers. Do your thorough background on them. Send them to the proper schools. Come up with good policies that'll protect our children, and and go with that. Um, you know that way they're working. You're not going through two or three supervisors to get an answer if somebody messes up. The buck's gonna stop with Dr. Paul. And if I could recommend anything else, you know, going into the schools, and I know we talked about school security, but um, teachers in classrooms, they're, I know y'all have some money, just saying. <laughs> Door locks for teachers' classrooms. Um, they come out with several. They fit on top of pistons. Um, they're not very expensive, but it's a low dollar item that every school teacher could have in their classroom to secure the door or something bad would happen. We got locked down in school. Um, I hear you all talking about ways to spend some money. Well, y'all see the defibrillators in the hallways and stuff that y'all have at school. Um, there's actually trauma packs you can get. Um, each officer, um, each deputy has uh, a go bag and a police car, but we have like one tourniquet, some bandages and stuff in our go bag, but they make these trauma packs that have like seven tourniquets in them, uh, wound uh, dressings, um, if they can be placed in a school somewhere in the hallway, maybe by the front office, that would be something nicely, that would be nice to be added to every school in Akamai County. And they're about 800 bucks a piece. Mm -hmm. How much would they have? Oh, yes. They're like trauma packages. How much? <laughs> Just there on and it's got tourniquets, bandages. And God forbid anything like that would happen, but it would be a life saving measure for kids. Is there a, 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 a um, switching gears, is there a current technology um, for an active shooter that 
were born under this rule. So you're familiar about it. And a few years ago, there was a technology where certain white board looking things could be held up by a teacher. Or they, they do have, uh, they're almost like a blanket now that goes over the classroom door if something like that would happen. There's different things you can get. There's hundreds of things you can do to improve inside classroom security. But the cheapest thing is those door locks, the barricades. And I believe well, I've done active shooter training for for school here, about uh, Scott Reed and I used to do it. Um, I think there was examples of them on that training station. Yes. What would be an average salary that you would pay for the SSO? Is like a good starting pay to attract people to be your SSOs? In I can tell you what I started that is at. Okay. General Assembly could always change it or whatever, but at this point, it's in the base at risk budget.
and our children, period. Normally, the uh, you said the pay was eighteen dollars per hour for the security guards. Is what they were representing. I'm the average wage for the security officer throughout life was eighteen dollars an hour, and it cost thirty-seven thousand a year. And the field supervisor and one other is twenty-three dollars an hour. Yeah. So to do the math here, if you get 925000 and you divide it by 20 people, uh, the average salary is $46,250. Um, obviously, if you hire the SSOs, you know, it's coming directly from McNamara County, not, you know, third party. Uh, I think if you get better applicants, whatever, not to get to pay $46,250, whatever, but um, it would be a lot more than $18,000 an hour. In my opinion, I think if you get better and plus people whenever that would, that would apply to the job. I can tell you how much it is. Um, it's $18 an hour, that's for 190 days. That's what the person would get paid. The bill rate is $24.84 per person. And <coughs> we don't have a problem with the SSOs. The problem is gonna come when you have to fund them, you have to train them, and you're gonna have to have someone to supervise them, so that means another administrative position that we're gonna to have to hire also in the division. So, and look at how many how many of them are we going to have in the building. With this um, quote here from Ally, you had um, four at both, um, four at, four at Nandor High, four at Nandor Middle, um, four at Arcadia High, four at Arcadia Middle. Um, one at Shinko High, one at Shinko Middle, so that's two, really, at Shinko Combined School. And then you have a field supervisor and an account manager. So that's what it means to the 20 that they were. So, so did the Allied have 20 people uh, waiting to start? Is that what they're telling you? That's what they're asking. Question, question. If I'm helping. Um, when I asked a question about where would they recruit, just tell me if I'm helping. Um, they said they would recruit local and come to Salisbury and North and South. Well, what I'm saying is, so Ally, obviously, the 18 officers and two administration, where they don't have them like in the wings right now, so they would have to interview and hire just like if we did SSOs, we would have to find 20 people, right? Right, but the thing is, they know what 
they're doing. We don't have to train somebody to do this job. This is what they do. Uh, and right now, mm -hmm. they were saying we did it um, when we said we would, so then probably get it approved. It was in October, um, sometime late October before they could get them here. Now, I don't think they can do that because it's, they're pushing it back. Plus, Jessica has just asked them to come in and do them. So I don't know where, I mean, except for some areas, so I don't know where they would do it or whatever. But all of that is their responsibility. The training, the uniform, the everything is on them. The administrative piece of it, all of that's on them. None of that is on us except our principal would be the ones in the building who would also be able to say, this person's not doing their job and report to their lead person that we're not satisfied with that person. Just like any other contract person that we hire, we can report to their supervisor that this person is not performing their duty. Chair, I move that we look into getting the um, SSOs and bait detectors and alternate ed site. Second. There is a motion and a second for the SSOs, the bait detectors, and an alternative ed site. All in favor? Uh, Aye. Aye. Opposed? Nay. Nay. Hold, if you're opposed, hold your hand up.
it's five to four. The motion passes. I would say we just put a timeline on the SSOs where if nobody applies within a month or something, we obviously need something. And I'm all about security. You know, uh, I would rather no SSO than the allies, but so we need something. So if nobody applies for SSO, then we need to go to plan B. So we need something. I agree. Is that, do we add that to our motion or is that just? I would think about it. Could we have something? Get a job description for the SSOs and to find out a salary and to get someone to oversee all of this. I'll just smile on one more quick. Thank you. Yes, I appreciate that. But I don't know. Yes, just I'll agree with that. It would be helpful. So then the date, there were three things that were approved. The date, you know, the next step to vote yeah. is we need some calls and estimates for those as well as some. Is this the one? Typically placed in student bathrooms to detect when their Correct. students are being. <coughs> so, so one per bathroom. Is that what we want to do one per bathroom for each of the high schools, or do we want to try one school and then go from there? Or? Let's see. There can, let's see how much they're going to run. children that are in the classroom now the opportunity to be in the cafeteria I, I know maybe sometimes maybe I'll be bus lady or but let's just still make it so all the kids have the opportunity to have yes I, I would certainly hope so they would okay. it would they would go back to whatever they were doing pre COVID. I mean however the schools did that whether they came right from the bus or they dropped their coat at the classroom and then came for breakfast. Um,
And <clears throat> at this time of the year, to start changing things, because we had known this was gonna be a question, or we had known this was gonna come up, and maybe we could have changed some things, but right now, we've got interventions that are being put in place, plus Brandon has a grant, right, that mm -hmm. we, so even if they came in the cafeteria and ate, it still has to be a bag because of the grant that he was approved for the, the grab and go breakfast. So they would still have to come in and get their bag and they could sit in the cafeteria <coughs> or they would have to grab their classroom, but they can't go to the serving line for breakfast because the grant says that this is, this is the way you have to do it according to the grant. Um, I think that would be fine, that that would, that would keep their desk clean and from being sticky, and it would keep the food in here so the bugs and the mice wouldn't be attracted to the classroom. The other issue, and I'm not trying to say that it's something yeah, I know what we did before, I mean, I've been a principal as always. The other thing is, who's going to monitor the cafeteria? You can't get all of the kids in the cafeteria at the same time. Mm -hmm. So usually they have three <coughs> breakfasts and things like that, and they were having breakfast in the cafeteria. So that's going to pose a problem. Are you going to have kids that are going to want to stay in the cafeteria? <coughs> you going to have those that want to go in the classroom and eat breakfast. Um, so you have the monitoring issue, and that's going to be that's what's going to cut into your instructional time in the morning because that's not built in. That time is, is not built in right now. Ms. Farrell can, can add to that. I know that she and some principals are talking about.
sell the practices. I get that, Brandon. You don't. It, I mean, unless you have. I mean, we understand you want yeah. to give away all the practices, but yeah. it's that has created another problem. And I guess if they, if you still want them to eat lunch in the, or breakfast in the classroom, then what can we do about the critter situation? I mean, it was it was brought up to me last year. I will say, um, some of the teachers have said they've a mess in my classroom. I wish we could come up with a better solution to getting the kids to eat without making the mess. So I understand that part of it. That's that's definitely an issue we face. But I will say, if we take it, like like Dr. Hall said, we still have to serve a grab and go, which is fine. I'm not. I have no preference, truly, where the kids eat their breakfast. However, we have to look at the pros and cons of instruction time, make sure our schedule fits the meal service schedule because we have kids coming in without time to eat in 15 to 20 minutes and then they go to their classroom we can't serve them once they go to that classroom if we're not doing breakfast after the bell so this is a grant it's not it's, it's, it's a grant but it's a state program called breakfast after the bell and it kind of fits in with CEP because the goal is to provide students breakfast no matter when they arrive at school so if they arrive at 10 o'clock we need to provide them breakfast I don't understand but the problem would be when students come in late how are we going to serve them in the cafeteria without them missing class? So they would still have to take their breakfast to the classroom, so we would still end up having, I mean, middle and high school especially, still a lot of food in the classroom because we have a lot of students coming in late. Um, and even if they come in 10 minutes late, they're still not going to have time. If they're not coming in until 8.30 and your instruction starting at 8.45, you're still not going to have time to eat in that amount of period. Even if you're five minutes late, that's going to leave them with maybe five minutes to eat their entire breakfast. So I think we just need to look at the pros and cons of, yes, serving the kids in the classroom or serving them in the cafeteria, but also making sure we're not cutting into instruction or forfeiting any sort of funding that we do get. Um, because every school that participates in Breakfast After the Bell gets a monthly payment based on the number of meals that we serve in that school for the entire year. So like this year, we're receiving funding for last year's Breakfast. I think we just need to look at a schedule that's going to accomplish both and be as efficient as we can as far as getting the kids in the school. Because I will tell you, I was at Kegaten this morning. I know it's the first day of school. It's going to take a couple weeks. But I will tell you, we were we had kids sitting there at 9 o'clock in the cafeteria who hadn't even been released to class yet. So if we run into running behind, buses are late, kids are late, we are going to run out of our instruction. We're going to run into our instruction time and just try and defeat them. I guess that's all. So my question, just from a data standpoint, um, we have teachers at Mathematic Elementary, Shinkatank Elementary, and Shinkatank Elementary that they got from all of them. No, I, the, the, um, so far as the teachers complaining, the complaints, not, not just teachers, parents, or parents, I'm sorry. So, so the complaint is mainly that, that the, what they're doing with the remains of their lunch, like they're not eating breakfast. Yes. So it's, it's causing them to throw them. Or yes. To be a way that, I mean, how, how do they dispose of it? Did they throw it in a metal waste bin up by the front of the class, or did they apparently they're shoving it in the desk? Some of them are. Um, I don't know if they would come up brainstorming some way to, to collect the trash at the end and make sure they put it in there. Possibly. And I will say, when, when we have lunch periods and kids are coming to the cafeteria for lunch, I've seen where we can only fit about 125 to 150 students for lunch periods. So I really don't see if 350 kids get off the bus and really want to eat breakfast, how we're going to serve all them in 15 minutes in the cafeteria and have enough room, you know, for kids not being right on top of them. But, um, that may be a, an issue that we would encounter as well. Am I understanding that all the buses arrive at the same moment? They don't. They let them off at the same time. So, so the buses are out there, and the kids are waiting. But most until of them eight thirty. But most of them get there close to that, and then when eight thirty, they run back. Yeah, they're not sitting. I mean, this first week, of course, there's adjustment with buses, but on a typical day, 
you know, you're actually good for role within, but also you can really change when you look at and how it's good. You're not just sitting there waiting. So as the bus arrives, children are allowed to get off and come into the school? They release them when they, they let them go most of the time at 8.30, but they, I mean, that's a, an issue that they could look at, but they usually let them off at 8.30. Because of the safety concerns, right. too. We can't have you one bus on one day and the other school can have the same school. Day. Day. So it's not that I'm against changing it because I'm not, but I don't want to create more problems to try to cure one problem, cure the problem of the waste and the garbage, and then create a problem of us cutting into instruction, my staff not being able to fit everybody in the cafeteria to feed them, and then everybody running behind and second whole school day behind. I think we might create more problems than, than if we try to just cure the one problem. And maybe it is a simple way of collecting trash better in the classrooms. Um, and maybe down the road, you know, if we had the schedule that adjusts to letting the kids come into the cafeteria and having a room, but I, I, from what I've seen just in being in the cafeterias and the schools, I don't know that we have a room. I really don't, and the time. Um, you gotta give kids at least 10, 15 minutes to eat. Otherwise, they're not going to eat, and then they're gonna go straight to their classroom. And then that creates a problem in my end because we have no participation I serve no meals, we make no money. So, I mean, it all kind of ties in, and I think we have to work together to, to cure the problem. Um, yes, we do with the garbage and the waste, because I don't want our schools being a mess, uh, but I think we could cure that without creating three other potential problems down the road. Mr. Chairman. Um, Madam Chair, I guess my thought is that maybe we should have them look at it this year, and maybe we can do something next year, maybe how we can tweak possibly doing that. I mean, you know, it's something we can figure out tonight. I think it's something that we're gonna to have to look into and maybe adjust next year. And if, if not, then you know, if not, but at least take some time to maybe see if we can figure that out. That's just my impression of this. Madam Chair, yes. can I just give you some background on CEP? We actually started CEP before Brandon got here. Everybody was sent home with CEP. Okay. CEP is very, very good for this county. Every child gets a free breakfast and a free lunch. The elementary children benefit from it the most and participate the most. When we first considered doing CEP as a division, we had been offered several years to do it for just Matompkin, and we did not think that was fair. But then we were given the opportunity to apply for the whole division, and I thought it was very risky at the time, but how can you pass up something that would give every child a free breakfast and a free lunch? So when we first started this, it, it has to fund itself. You know, I'm not talking about making money, I'm just talking about right. it has to pay for itself or it'll be a, a drain on our, on our operating budget. Not that feeding everybody is, it isn't a worthy cause, but it must be self-sufficient. So we were looking at our participation rates and we had complete, now it was serving lines in the, in the, for breakfast in the cafeteria, it wasn't a grab and go. But our participation rate was only in the 30s for breakfast. And we knew that in order to be able to do this, we had to get all of our, and, and sustain it, which people are used to it now, so taking it away would be, would be awful. But we had to get our participation rate to the upper 80s, lower 90s. And the, the way that other divisions in the Commonwealth told us, and I'm like, there's no way we can get our participation rate from 30 something to 80 something. <coughs> And they said, yes, you can if you do breakfast in the classroom. And not, say, not saying it's not a mess, but that is the single biggest thing, because our lunch participation wasn't nearly as bad, but our breakfast participation was terrible. And that is the single thing that brought our participation, or I can't speak tonight, I'm sorry. I just don't, that, that percentage up to a level where it could be self-sustaining. So my, my biggest concern <coughs> is not sustaining participation levels, and if there is a change, that participation levels are monitored so that we can see a drop, because what Dr. Hall said is true. The elementary cafeterias carry the food service department because of their participation, and these are the same children who need it the most. By the time you get to middle, less participation, high, even less, and Matompkin, which who are the place that really needs it for those students, that is our number one um, number of meals, hands down. Okay. 
friend and that's your job. You have to figure out how they can uh, eat, lunch, eat breakfast in the cafeteria. Yeah, I spoke, to, I spoke to Dr. Madison today in the pumpkin and she, we kind of just bounced the idea around. Um, and I told her, I, I, I get it, what the teachers are complaining about, I understand there's food in there. But she seemed like she felt that she could pull it off, but at the same token, we don't know. We really wouldn't know um, with the instruction time, get the kids in how long it would take. You would just have to try it. But I would say right now, the best solution is, I have meetings all the time with other directors who do breakfast in the classroom, because there are, I'd say, I'd say 70 to 80% of the districts who under CEP are doing breakfast in the classroom simply because it doesn't cut into instruction time and they get funding for it. So we can provide different things for the kids. But I'd say that I could look into um, maybe some ideas that they're they're coming up with in the classrooms to, to cut down on waste and cut down on the amount of garbage um, and trash being left there on the classroom. So maybe it's just a policy we have to come up with um, to make sure all the trash is getting disposed of and not thrown into you know deaths. That would be what I would say we could do. And maybe that's, maybe Dr. Madison is on to something. Maybe we need to, before we do the whole division, maybe we let her, or maybe we just test that at one school and see how they can get it to work and still keep the participation rate up. Yeah, that's kind of what we what we talked about earlier. I said, you know, I, I'm, it's not that I'm absolutely against doing grab and go and have them come in here. But like I said, I just don't want to create a bigger problem than we already have and have everybody in chaos. and and really affecting instruction because that's number one. My food service is, you know, is important, but I know instruction is number one. So that's just something we have to discuss and you know, I'm welcome to, to try it, I guess, if that's what, something that we want to do um, and see, see what we can do with it. So, but I can, in the meantime, I can talk <coughs> to the directors and see how they're handling breakfast in the classroom um, and just see if there's anything different that they're doing that we're not. Because like I know for lunch, we're gonna start share tables so I cut down on the reduce the waste. It's gonna take a little bit to do that, but we're gonna do that for lunch. So maybe there's something similar, like in the classrooms as far as waste and, and you know garbage we can look at. presentation. Uh, in reviewing the, the old Evergreen pre presentation last spring, uh, these are the titles and positions that were more than 20% behind market value in terms of their salary bid points. Um, so, you know, we, we have to stay competitive so we can attract talent. And it's not about 
our current current employees, it's about the future. It's about what we do a few years from now if we have openings. I would, just like we were talking about with the SSOs, we have to be able to attract those people and, and give a, a competitive salary uh, to attract talent and, and then retain talent. Uh, so these positions uh, on this slide were the most egregious in terms of behind the curve. Uh, the next few slides I'm going to show you are the titles of our positions for our classified employees and administrators. There's also a slide uh, with bus drivers, and some of you probably have to be able to preview this, but this is what Evergreen is recommending for our new pay bands. And I have and today, before you move on, I just did want to clarify on the previous slide. So um, in terms of those positions that were more than 20% behind Mark, I just wanted to remind you all that part, those are the salary ranges for those positions, not individual employee salaries. So um, this slide is referring to the, the minimum starting salary to the maximum earning salary for the position, not the actual earning salaries of the individuals that are currently in those positions. So just wanted to clarify that. Thanks, Alex. Okay, the first, uh, group that we have here are classifieds, and I'm not going to read every single one, but if you look at these, I think all of the board members have it on your computer, correct? On the left, you'll see the 12-month positions and their new proposed pay bands. On the right, you'll find the 10-month positions. And as these, uh, you, you see it starts with C1, right? C2, C3. As it progresses, the role of that position increases in terms of the responsibility, the risk, the role of that individual. So any questions about the first slide here? Yeah, I'm gonna keep, I'm gonna keep rolling through this, okay? So here's the next group of classifies. And again, as you can see, uh, as these roles progress, the amount of education and training and the, the the roles in the organization are increasing as we go. Okay, so finally we get here to the upper end of the uh, classified folks here at uh, C17 and C18. C18 is the highest uh, rating that we have. You can see network engineer, uh, network admin, uh, C17, you can see there RNs, school nurses are RNs. So uh, these, was, these were folks who got uh, we're at the top of the classified uh, list here, our social workers and so on and so forth. Any questions about any of the classified? Yeah. Um, so I noticed looking at what they presented in June to now, the, uh, I guess it was C11, the LPN. Um, here you have a 31, 6, 600, $6,000, $47,499. But uh, when we had back in June, they were 45 or 68. Why is the fluctuation from that now? I, I had a similar issue, um, and I think what what we had to take into account was the the 12 month and the 10 month. So I was looking at some. I got confused with that as well, and how they had to clarify that for me. Um, the you you have to prorate some of these for um, like the C11 band, if you go back to it, if you notice, uh, where is that, that C11? So it's missing right now because we don't have any C11s that are 12 months. So since the LPNs are 10 months, you have to prorate over, over a 10 month period. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. Any other questions? So that's the same, I guess, with the C16 for the mental health counseling? Yeah, the, the 12 month uh, salaries are going to be just a little bit bigger, two months prorated higher than the 10 month. Yeah. All right, uh, this only actually did a lot of uh, collaborating with uh, Evergreen for the bus driver pay, so I'm going to let her tell you about that. Big spread in the current pay of those um, of those 
employees. We looked at uh, daily rates, we looked at just the base daily rate and as soon as a four hour run, and then if they had a tier on top of that, we did not include that, we kept the tier in the house, so we were looking at, at daily rates uh, comparing to our cohort group. And um, we ended up getting them on the scale based on their number of years experience. It, it provided, like I said, a lot of grace for the ones who've only been here a few years and not much of a race for the ones who've been here for four years. We also included uh, about eight in, in that study. The next slide that you see are your uh, administrator position that's all on one slide there, starting at A1 up through uh, the superintendent at A10. So you can see that, the, again, the different roles, risks, responsibilities as they go up, so to the numbers uh, beside the A. Uh, and these are all 12 month positions, so there's no um, confusion there between 12 and uh, 10 months. some data on the average um, raises for some of the employees, but yeah, they're all increased. I, I don't have exactly what the percentage is. I think some of them are different, uh, but this is all provided to us from Evergreen and, and to get us to be more competitive in the job market. So it's all, Allie, did you have anything to add about uh, how you uh, came up with those new pay bands? Right. So the uh, sliding in each position or each classification into the finance is based on the internal hierarchy and the needs of the division, and then also that market salary uh, information that we collected from your market leaders. So these might be a little different than what you saw before because we We also, just to add, we also, um, Evergreen helped us out. The, the pay structure for classified is over 30 years. And in a, a cost saving effort, they originally had 20 years for the admin. We stretched it out to 25 for the life of the admin because we have several admins who have been with us for several years and would be at the top of each scale or maybe even over the top of the scale, which was called being problematic. So uh, we, this, it took a lot of collaboration between us and Evergreen to come up with something that works for us and still stay true to the study. So, so you said it, it shrunk this time from situation where um, two or three employees potentially could earn more money than the superintendent. So, yeah, it, that would be problematic.
So before I discuss this slide, I just want to make this crystal clear. Um, each employee will receive a different level of salary adjustment according to this study. So it's not a one size fits all. It's not everybody's going to get 5% or everybody's going to get 7.5%. There's a lot, of, there's some variation. Of course, we had a budget, so we had to keep, keep things, you know, within a certain budget. Um, so this slide just gives a kind of a cross section of some different uh, employees and uh, on average what they would make. I tried to keep employees that just had one or two employees that would skew the data a little bit. So we have 11 principals. So on average, the principals would receive a 4.2% uh, increase. Uh, you can see any, your average classified worker, just over 4%. Uh, custodians, 9.3% on average. I'm not gonna read every single one to you, but you, you kind of get the gist. But all the employees that were included in this study on average received 5.4%. Uh, so uh, there, there are some who get, who get a larger, a little bit of a larger adjustment, and some, there's, there's a few employees, probably about a dozen employees, who are not gonna get any adjustment at all because uh, the study deemed that they were uh, not eligible for one. So there's a lot of variation, but this is trying to make our pay scale equitable. And um, you know, treat our employees, you know, the right way, and retain our employees. Okay. Um, any questions about this slide right here? Uh huh. Uh, I don't know if this slide, but uh, did this bring everybody up to the fifteen dollars per hour? Well, that that was something that uh, Ms. Only and I, Dr. Hall, have talked about. Uh, the next thing that I wanted to try to take on were uh, some of the hourly rates. Uh, these are all salary folks. So, you know, the, the folks that we do pay by hour, we, we would like to look at. And, uh, you know, we could do that ourselves. We, Sorry, Allie, we wouldn't need Evergreen to do that. We could look at that ourselves and try to uh, maybe do a study to see where we can compare with some other folks in terms of hourly employees. So we're starting to have an Yeah, I think the current minimum, correct me if I'm wrong, is thirteen dollars and thirteen cents. hourly rate for a uh, entry-level cafeteria worker be? So the proposed hourly rate for a cafeteria worker would be uh, $13.50 an hour. So you know, we wanted to make this as competitive as possible, but making sure that we're, we're keeping in mind the budgetary restrictions as well. Um, so this brings you so the, the average for the market results, so the, and, and keeping in mind that those market peers uh, that we selected, so looking at those uh, peers on that first slide, um, those were selected um, in conjunction with um, the division's leadership team um, as ones that were competitive um, or ones that you compete with for quality employees, ones that they had a similar size, structure, or offerings to that of the division. Um, um, but looking at the comparison there, it came in at 1305 an hour for your cafeteria workers. So that's why we slotted them in at 1350. Um, again, trying to make this competitive as possible, but also keeping your budget in mind. Something I'd like to add as well. Um, well, I'm the type that, hey, if we got the money, let's you know make our wages as competitive as possible. It makes my job easier uh, to hire people. But uh, you have to also have a distinction between an hourly employee 
and we have a few of those, and a salary employee. So you, when you're salaried, you also get a bunch of perks uh, like retirement and health insurance and, and time off. When you're an hourly employee, you, you don't get any of those. If you don't work, uh, you don't get paid. So, um, you know, there's benefits to being salaried as opposed to, to hourly that you have to also factor in, in my opinion. So there are all calculated where we're salaried or hourly? Most, most of our are salary, correct, Brandon? Most are, uh, we do have a few hourly too. Okay, he has a handful of hourly. Other questions? Okay. Again, Beth and I and Dr. Hall, uh, in keeping with uh, the budget, we have been on the budget, and this study at the end is a little bit north of $920,000, almost $921,000. So, um, you know, we felt like, you know, we wanted to, to stay true and not take it up to the last dollar. We've also hired, this is not like up to the second data, so we've, you know, the last couple of uh, personnel reports, we have to add them into the, so we wanted to leave a little room uh, so that we wouldn't go over budget. Right. right, so this is like a changing document. So uh, in this case, the health coordinator position, we left that in there as a previous person, because you have to have placeholder of some sort. So this number is going to move. Same thing with some of the nurses, some of the more recently filled positions, school board office receptions. It's not updated for that, but we have a placeholder of the previous employee in there to try to look to make sure that our total is where it needs to be. So uh, on this slide, this is, uh, there we go, it's better. All right, so here are some reasons why uh, we would like to ask you to put the recommendations in place uh, tonight. This process has been delayed, uh, originally set to be implemented July 1st. I know our employees are waiting on it. This is the thing that the employees ask me about the most by far. Um, the payroll department needs to put the new salary information in if it is uh, put into place so that they can start a new payroll system that starts, supposed to be starting October the 1st. So time is not on our side with this. Uh, this again will help the division to recruit new employees and retain our current employees. Um, this will also make us more competitive in the employment marketplace. And uh, also something that's not as time crucial, but uh, administratively, HR, the HR department, the payroll department is going to have to reach out to every employee. Because again, it's not like I'm saying every employee is getting 5.4%. It could be this employee's 2.3, this employee's 7.9. Sorry, Mr. Malcolm, you didn't get any adjustment and then have to explain all that, if that makes sense. So uh, that's what we're asking. We're asking for you to uh, put these recommendations in place um, so that we can get busy doing that work and uh, we feel like it was an equitable process and a much needed process. Any, any last question? The part of this that we haven't gotten to yet, because obviously it has to be adopted by this school board first, is that this will become uh, something that we will, Evergreen will show us and we will adjust every year so that we don't get in the same position that we were before, that the beginning salaries never increase. So it won't be outdated. We will be adjusted by a cost of living increase or whatever for, for every step every year. And it also places, just like for teachers, it places a maximum. Okay, when you get the top, you're at the top. And if you, if we increase the scale by the cost of living, then you'll get a cost of living. But it will, and if, if you're above the top, you won't, you won't get anything. So it, it does, it's similar to the teacher scale and that once you get to the top, you're at the top and all you get is cost of living. And, and but yet we'll be able to move forward so that 10 years down the road, we can't say, we can't hire a bus driver because we haven't changed our scale since 2024. We're going to adjust it every year like we do teachers. So it will be a, a, a living document that hopefully we can hire people. More questions for Allie. Um, my question is, um, so the student support monitors, they're all our way. Yes. And the instructional assistants, are they? They're salary. They're salary. They're, they were included in the. They are included. In, in the study. Okay. 
and then in the interest of transparency, it would be nice. I know some school divisions have several salary scales. I think we have one for teachers. We might have our salary scale on the website, but it would be nice if there was a bus driver salary scale, a bookkeeper salary scale, a so one of the things that we had everybody do for us because people seem to like that salary scale structure is we had, because in the beginning it was all pay bands. And TJ's like, you know, if Jesse comes to me and he says, I have five years as a teacher and then I have 10 years as an administrator, or I'll do it backwards. 10 years as a teacher, five years as an administrator, you can say, oh, you got half credit for your 10 years as a teacher, that gives you five plus five more, here you are, step 10. So we do have those step and lanes for every C, a and B level, and we can put that, you know, we can put that out there. We wanted something that it wasn't like, I don't understand why I'm getting paid this, and you know, why is TJ getting more than me or whatever, so that we can actually do what we do with teachers and say, here is what you have, and this is what you're getting, and that's what this will, will be for. It, it may take us some time to get to where everybody's exactly on the right step where they're supposed to be. Um, because we did have some, we did have a limit, we did have a budget. Um, so, uh, it may, we can put that out there, but just so the employees know, um, uh, you know, if, if we had an unlimited budget, everybody would, you know, first year be it's on the exact step where we're supposed to be, but we didn't. So, some of the evergreen placed them on a step, but it may not reflect exactly what their years of service is. Does that, if that makes sense? Because there's a budget, I mean, there's a budget to how much we could spend. And we capped it, such that we're going to be seeing more than 15%, even as the study showed that they should be getting more than 15%. We put a 15% cap on ours. And what about, are, will there be employees that are already, even with this new salary range, that are already exceeding this? Yes. Uh, I think so what, that will be frozen or? Frozen. Right, until it happens. Uh, just, to, just one clarifying statement. The cap was set at 15, but to get them in the next step, we, we didn't round anybody down. So a couple people, there are a couple of anomalies. So there's a couple people that got a 16%. Uh, there was one person that got a 20%, but let me explain. This person was a bookkeeper first year so it took 20% just to get her to the minimum pay range. Does that make sense? Like she wasn't even at the, like in C5, she wasn't even at the, the entry level salary that the, that the uh, study proposed. So I'm saying 15% was the general cap, but there were a few anomalies that we had to do right by, so to speak. To get them just to the bottom step to of the range. bare minimum of the range, because we had paid them so, uncompetitively before. retroactive amount. See, this is why it's so difficult for payroll. So let's say it's past, past tonight. There'll be a retroactive amount because it was supposed to be July and August. Yeah. So, because that's what we've said all along, is that it would be effective July 1st. So this is why it's so difficult for payroll and, and this new implementation. So if it's <coughs> tonight and their September 16th paycheck, if we work them from the clock, they'll get the retro retroactive amount for July and August, plus their 16th pay will be their new amount. So that's, 
that's a whole lot of work for what our the whole up then for giving this to us tonight. What is the whole what was the hold up for giving us tonight instead of last meeting or back in you know, last month? I can I can uh, when I came on board, I mean, it's no, it's no indictment of my predecessor, but when I came on board in the last six weeks, uh, Beth and, and Dr. Hall both said uh, that, that I had done more work with this in six weeks than had been done in the last six months. I mean, it's more, it's a lot of uh, um, collaborating with the Evergreen people to make sure they have the right data. I mean, these are people's livelihoods. It's their paycheck. We didn't want to make any mistakes. If we rushed it to you last week, we were, we had planned to come uh, last meeting. Uh, we did, but then um, the Evergreen folks would bring up something like, "Hey, we're, we're missing this or this data." So we didn't want to rush it, but but we knew we needed to get it to you soon. So really, we've been meeting uh, once a week, sometimes twice a week, with the Evergreen folks. Uh, to make sure it was done right. And there may still be an error or two. I mean, I'm not gonna say it's foolproof, but it's, it's, um, it's to a point where we're confident that we could have you know, presented it to you and be ready to uh, uh, you know, move forward and let the employees know. So just to give you an example, when we were first shown this, let's just say that Mr. Taylor worked for us for 25 years or whatever as an assistant principal and then became a coordinator. <coughs> one year experience as a coordinator. When we got this, you were given credit for one year. One year. Even though you worked as 25 as an administrator, you were given credit for one year. So literally, at, it's about 450 people. <coughs> we went through each and every one of them. So if, <coughs> if Rhonda had been a teacher, for, we had to go back and get when they started with us, or if they did update, and also in the beginning, anybody who didn't start with us was not given any credit at all for anything unless they started with us. That's not fair. So we literally had to go through each and every employee, and I'd say, well, TJ, he has experience somewhere else. We had to go in their personal <coughs> file, dig out their prior year experience that was relevant that might not have been with Akamai County, and update each and every employee. And we didn't find this, well, I told him, <laughs> I came to him on the first day and I said, I'll let you have day one and then I'm gonna get you on day two. <laughs> but, but we had to go through each and every one because it wasn't fair. Somebody's worked with us in a different position. So in your example with Mr. Taylor, is it because he only got, he only got credit for one year because he moved from yeah. The principal scale to the coordinator scale, right. so he was starting so at the bottom of the, the coordinator scale. The data that Evergreen was given was that Mr. Taylor <coughs> had been one year. This is the data they were given, and they didn't know. <coughs> and, and it takes what you call institutional knowledge, and you know, he, they didn't know that's what they were given. But yes, he's had one year as a coordinator, so he starts at the bottom, and that's not really fair. If he's had you know 25 years in the system or what, whatever, it was it gave no credit for any of those years that they had served in a different position. And it literally, we had to go through, and we had to have Justine pulling through files, I was pulling through files, and we're counting up years. Right? Yeah, it was very helpful. I mean, it's a team effort. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's <laughs> and, and we didn't want to present something that we weren't confident. That we, are we still going to have to make some tweaks? Yes, but. Uh, that's, you know, we wanted to make it fair. And we didn't want it to come out, and you all had approved it, and then somebody said, well, this is ridiculous. I'm being paid as a step one coordinator, and I've worked for this county for 35 years. And, and, you know, we didn't want that to happen. We wanted it to be as close to accurate as we could get it. And then at the end, making sure we, we come in in budget. Right. So, like, if you take all the limits off, it would have been well over a million dollars, probably. 1.3, 1.4 million, something like that. that and and bus drivers right? were a challenge too. Yeah, so I mean, you know, we, we had to make, you know, we had to collaborate and make sure it came in on the budget and, and again, make sure everybody's numbers were correct. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
This doesn't include them. I'd just like to thank all the staff that came back, the veterans that came back to ACPS, and, and those new staff that came. Thank you for doing what you're doing. I uh, hope and pray we have a wonderful, blessed uh, school year. I also like to come in with him and thank all the um, staff, administrators. They were coming back for another year. I mean, Accomac, Accomac County Public Schools is one of the best. And also, I would like to thank. Hackman Elementary, y'all did a very good job on that presentation. Thank you. I would like to say a couple of things. Uh, first, you know, the wish we uh, had a safe school year um, and a productive school year. Um, and looking forward to working with my fellow board members to get a positive and productive school year on the board. And uh, you know, look forward to working with all you guys and uh, passing some positive steps forward this year. I'd like 
lay on last year. I can just say ditto. <laughs> no, but in all honesty, uh, Akamak, thank you for your hospitality, the presentations. Uh, tell the little girl that she did an excellent job. I'm, I'm glad she went home to get some sleep, but please pass that along. Uh, TJ, Beth, thanks for all the hard work you guys have done. Hopefully this will work out well for our employees and uh, and they'll be happier. I know they're happy, but let's make them happier. Money, money always made me happy. <laughs> um, and let's, like everybody else says, let's have a good school year. Let's make it safe. Let's educate our children. And let's get it done. Did. I visited every school today in every classroom. They went to every classroom, every school I had. I got almost 8,000 steps um, because I finished today. But it was a wonderful day. Everybody was excited. And um, I think I only saw a couple of prime students, um, kindergartners, and I think one preschooler that really just did not want to be there. But anyway, um, our enrollment today was 4,000. <coughs> 302, and um, last year on the same day it was 4,244. So we were 58 students down, and it's not bad at all on the first day because a lot of them are still on vacation. They don't want to come back. Right? <laughs> so tomorrow that might pick up and um, more. Cell phones, everybody was wondering what the first day of cell phones would look like, or new cell phones would look like. Shaking the head, no occurrences today. Mandela had not really an occurrence, but uh, I think a student forgot to silence her, his or her cell phone, so they had one. I can't even have about 14 today, so um, they're, they've got some work with, <coughs> with the cell phones. Um, no major issues on the buses. Um, of course, first day, they're going to always be late. I think I got a text from Chris that they all were finally in at what, six, about six o'clock. And first day, that's not too bad get them in, but um, no major issues there. Um, TJ is now an HR gentleman. He finished the program and did everything that he was supposed to do. And that's basically, I, I, I think we're going to have a great year. Um, the speaker that we had for opening day, it's still resonating in the hallways. Um, her message to everybody. And um, <clears throat> everybody's excited, and you can see the bulletin boards are reflective of all of that. So I'm excited about the new school. Dr. Hoff, uh, I guess the rare question is how many staff members do we have crying today? <laughs> 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 this is the session. Yes. Uh -huh. The board will adjourn the closed meeting as allowed by section 2.